thank you very much, Andreas, and thanks to the organizers for uh, creating this wonderful venue and giving me the opportunity to contribute here with my talk, uh, which I renamed. Not the content, uh, the content didn't change, but I renamed this uh, rather boring title in the program to the transition metal oxygen, uh, 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 the transition metal oxide oxygen issue, starting revision on the two particle level. And as this title already suggests, this is a uh, work that we uh, just started, um, but it is uh, very much uh, in the context also to the previous talk uh, uh, and the discussion that followed here about how to model uh, uh, oxides. And I think uh, one part uh, uh, which is responsible for this exceptional uh, uh, nice predictivity of the, of the previous theory is that uh, in these nickelates, this oxygen issue is not as large as maybe in others. Okay, so let me start by introducing the people who are involved and in doing the actual work. That is people in Erlangen, uh, Yiting and uh, Henry in my group. And this has been from the start, a close collaboration with the organizer here in Stuttgart, Thomas, uh, and in particular also Marcel and Mario in his group. So yesterday we had this uh, very nice panel discussion about emergent phenomena. Uh, interdisciplinary and uh, what it means. And uh, actually it has been a long time ago since I started introducing my talks about correlated many body quantum systems with classical examples of correlated systems. So you don't need quantum mechanics for emergent behavior as we also said uh, yesterday evening. And I usually uh, choose our European uh, leaders and countries whose correlation and interaction give rise to new states uh, in correlated quantum matter, it's new states of matter, of course. And uh, here we go. So that's the sketch of the uh, cuprate phase diagram. And obviously the ultimate goal uh, of us is to understand and explain these kind of phase diagrams. And when I say understand and explain, of course, I mean in scientific way, predict something. Yeah. So that what what, what uh, explaining and understanding means. Um, and uh, so uh, what is the uh, way that we, that we predict uh, 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 physics in such systems, like uh, for example, in the previous talk? Well, the first step of such prediction uh, calculations is the art of modeling. And it's not something that is uh, artificially put on top of uh, as an auxiliary tool, but it's the very way that we think, uh, in my opinion. So uh, we have to create a model of the world in order to create phenomena. And modeling is actually ubiquitous in human life. It's not only that we are doing models for, for materials, but in uh, this uh, uh, snippet of this painting by Picasso from 1945, you can see uh, how modeling uh, is really also happening in art. And in our case, um, yeah, please. The uh, top left is the, the this guy. And then it's a, it's a, you will see other uh, others of, these, uh, of this guy. No, no, it started with the more complicated one and reduction, uh, re reducing the, the, the ingredients. Well, you can fight about what's the right way to, to view it. But I think the original starts from the complicated one. But of course, uh, I mean, you don't need the, 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 the spots on the butt of the bull in order to understand the essence of what a bull is, right? And uh, so uh, to, to uh, not overstress this, uh, this uh, analogy too much, this is DFT. And then uh, we are, well, cutting, cutting, and we arrive at a, at a, at a simplistic model. Yeah? And this is uh, by, by, by not by any means any kind of judgment. And you can, you can uh, already, this is a model, right? And already, so there is where the analogy ends. So that's the art of modeling. And uh, then there is, of course, also the art of solving the models, right? And uh, the art of solving the models, uh, here there are many people uh, are solving low energy lattice Hamiltonians by means of dynamical mean field theory. Uh, uh, which is an approximation that has a controlled limit in, in, the, in, the, in infinite coordination numbers. Um, and of course, you create uh, uh, the possibility of capturing local superpositions or so, so a quantum mechanical superposition of local configurations. Yeah? 
And uh, when you found the auxiliary problem in a DMFT calculation, then typically what you extract from that is the single particle vertex, the self energy, uh, but also uh, uh, more and more nowadays for more sophisticated uh, approximation schemes like the gamma A, for example, or also to compute more uh, 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 information rich observables, you can extract this impurity vertex. So the two particle vertex from the auxiliary problem. And from these quantities, you can continue to compute observables that you can compare to experiment. And in the case of the single particle vertex, you can compute single particle observables. And that's the Green's function, and that's photo emission spectra, densities, et cetera, et cetera. However, uh, and that's where the field uh, moved in the recent years more and more, is also to predict two particle observables, which are, of course, much more complicated uh, uh, objects to calculate. But we, we, uh, we arrived there. And there's a beta psi theta equation in which here at this point, the uh, impurity vertex can enter as, a, as, an, as an approximation in order to compute the response function uh, to magnetic fields or, or whatever kind of two particle observer you are interested. Then if you, uh, if you put a little bit more work into, you can uh, use parquet equations to translate this kind of vertex into, uh, uh, into a pairing vertex, which you might use in an Eliasberg kind of theory in order to also predict superconductivity. And as this is a talk about the project which has just started and I have not really opportunity to advertise here something, let me take this opportunity to just advertise uh, some previous work which were actually using the two particle vertex in order to give predictions about superconductivity. So in 2018, we, were, we did uh, this uh, combined Eliasberg plus dynamical mean field studies on systems which are effectively uh, single band systems. Um, and most recently we could uh, also handle, uh, thanks to uh, uh, Stefan and Hugo, uh, this uh, two particle vertex with orbital degrees of freedom uh, in this uh, uh, study about strontium ruthenate. But let's get back to the coup rates and uh, let's get back to uh, modeling. So here you have uh, Pablo and Picasso. No, there is uh, actually, uh, uh, Sasha is sitting here uh, also in the audience. This is a paper which you need to read when you want to understand the genealogy of cuprate models from a DFT perspective. Um, and in fact, uh, there is uh, the DFT band structure, which you can see here on the right hand side for this lantern uh, uh, copper oxide. And there are selected degrees of freedom, so to say, in this, uh, uh, in this uh, uh, energy uh, range. So, uh, which already is a step then uh, towards a, a, a reduced model, which consists of these four states around the Fermi level. And then this is actually an important starting point because a whole family of models with which cuprates have been treated in the past is derived from these kind of from this starting point. And this is, for example, the models that we started to deal with here uh, uh, for the D7 nickelates uh, together with uh, Ole and Ginyard. Uh, which is basically uh, 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 a downfolded version uh, distinguishing planar and axial degrees of freedom. Then there is, of course, the, uh, the, 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 the model, which I will continue talking about a little bit more, which includes oxygen degrees of freedom explicitly. Um, and then there is the single band model when you have put everything into one effective orbital, which of course has nothing to do anymore with an atomic uh, X square minus Y square orbital, uh, but basically captures the quasi-particle dispersion at T uh, at the Fermi energy, okay? All right, and all of these uh, different models allow for different uh, perspectives uh, and different possibilities to, uh, to make predictions. And I will continue in this talk uh, with the uh, two simplest uh, uh, models or two selected models, the one where I include oxygen degrees of freedom explicitly and the other one where they are uh, already uh, projected out or included implicitly. So the goal, as I said earlier, was uh, predictions of phase diagrams or predictions of how the correlated system acts to external perturbation like temperature changes or uh, pressure or doping like here. Um, of course, 
uh, we are not as uh, ambitious here and we have just started so we are not uh, we do not want to cover this whole phase diagram but we could uh, restrict ourselves uh, to some uh, simple single particle observable uh, which is either uh, the, the photo emission spectrum or in this case even simpler a mass renormalization which we can estimate from calculations and on the two particle level we can look at magnetic response uh, as for example measured here in the uh, uh, group of Hase in Leipzig by NMR uh, in terms of the night shift. So these are basically the goals uh, that we set ourselves uh, uh, to, 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 to target. So the, uh, the two simple uh, models for the bull are here. So that there's nothing special in, the, in these uh, Hamiltonians. Uh, it's a Kanamori type uh, interaction. This is the brilliant zone, which I plot here, the path from gamma XM back to gamma. And on the left-hand side, you have the Emery type model. And on the right-hand side, you have the, let's say, downfolded version of, the, of this, which just represents the bands at the Fermi energy. So you can see here that there is mixed orbital character and closer the oxygens are, the more there is hybridization between them. And this is what creates the importance of oxygen also in the periodic table when you go to copper and nickel, but also when you go to, uh, to earlier transition metals, oxides, uh, but at high valence. So for example, uh, chromates are also uh, systems where oxygen uh, states are quite close. Anyway, so before digressing further, let me just uh, 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 state that we are doing calculations at a static uh, interaction in which we only include uh, the, the D interaction for now. Uh, I know that there is many things, many parameters in this model that you could tweak, but we started with the simplest possible choices. We are doing as in our first step uh, reasonable, uh, only a single side DMFT. Um, we are using a CT hype uh, uh, impurity solver with W2 dynamics and uh, also uh, tricks, by the way. Um, and we are looking at the doping and the T dependence. Yeah. Um, okay. There's a, this, this was a typo. So let me start with the single particle spectra. Uh, these are the self energies. So we extract the single particle vertex from the auxiliary impurity problem and we Trans, uh, we, we analytically continue this self energy. And as you can see, here is the real part. And here is the imaginary part. So zero here is, is the Fermi level, so to say. And what you can see here is that in all of these calculations, basically you see a linear behavior of the real part. And you might say a quadratic or at least uh, not completely deviating from quadratic behavior of the imaginary part, which means that these are all Fermi liquid uh, self energies, yeah? So, however, one has to state that uh, these self energies, the different colors are different dopings, by the way. Uh, these self energies are local on the orbital, uh, uh, in the orbital basis. So this is the self energy of the D orbital. Uh, but of course, the orbital basis is not the eigen basis of the quasi particle band here uh, uh, in this, uh, at the Fermi energy, because it's of mixed orbital character. So we can, of course, when we have these kind of self energies plot uh, k-dependent uh, spectral functions, uh, but what we could also do is we could look at the Fermi level and this green uh, box here, the colors are not really coming out too well, uh, showing the orbital uh, character change across the, the Fermi level. But what you can do is you can translate, so to say, this self energy uh, into the eigenbasis of the band at the Fermi level. That means that basically by doing this three-band calculation, you get a k-dependent quasi-particle renormalization, yeah? So, uh, or k-dependent self-energy, if you want. Uh, so the, the, the k-integrated uh, spectral function then includes uh, basically the states uh, which come, uh, so excitations which involve oxygen and, uh, 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 and, uh, uh, and D states. So here you might call this uh, Zhang Rai's uh, Zinglet state um, if you want. So here you have in this doped case, a quasi particle, which is clearly composed of B and P states together. You have Hubbard bands, you have a charge, charge transfer band. And that's what uh, uh, this calculation allows you to extract. So in single band calculation, um, of course, uh, you have less uh, degrees of freedom and you have a na more narrow energy window. So here in this case, um, 
the, uh, uh, the, the parameter, which in the previous model, by the way, was taken from uh, uh, CRPA calculations from uh, authors in the Tablet group. Uh, so here we, uh, we simply said, okay, uh, in order to, to fix the interaction uh, uh, strength of the single band model, we just want to reproduce the quasi-particle mass renormalization. And that works fairly well. But of course, uh, you get uh, things correct, and or you can capture things like the quasi particle mass renormalization, um, which, by the way, uh, is actually for the for the chosen interaction values, uh, which came from CRPA in quite decent agreement with experiments. Here, uh, so infrared and optical uh, estimates for this mass mass renormalization. Um, but of course, the spectral function. Uh, you do not have things like charge transfer gaps or, uh, uh, or, or uh, features which come from higher energies than, uh, than the energies just at the Fermi level. All right, so let's go now after we have uh, seen and made these, uh, let's say, uh, uh, checks for the renormalization on, this, on these models, let's go to the two particle level. And let's go to the magnetic response and we start again uh, uh, with, uh, with uh, a three band version. Um, and I should say here that these calculations, they were not yet done uh, with the beta zeta equation, but with a, a, an applied field, uh, which however is the result of the beta zeta equation at omega zero and q equals to zero. So here you can compare the, the single side dynamical mean field results uh, over a temperature range and doping shown here in different colors with the night shift. Uh, and the night shift, of course, there is a scaling between the two that we do not uh, uh, quite know, but we can uh, uh, plot uh, the, uh, so to say, the response function that was calculated against the uh, measured one. And we can see that basically the doping and the temperature dependence, uh, uh, what we can see here is basically captured qualitatively uh, by a single model, okay? So we have two phenomena uh, uh, covered with the same model in the sense that we have the quasi particle mass renormalization at the Fermi energy and the magnetic response uh, uh, done. So now you might uh, uh, say, okay, I'm, I'm telling you something about a downturn of the magnetic susceptibility here in this calculation and uh, ask if I'm claiming about anything about pseudo gap physics or so, and certainly not. So if you look at the self energies that we have calculated, uh, they are all Fermi liquid like self energies and there is nothing uh, which goes beyond the, this uh, local limit, yeah? Okay, so uh, if we go back now to the uh, single band model, um, also remain with uh, a single side DMFT, we have, a, we have trouble uh, to, uh, to uh, let's say, reproduce also at higher temperatures, let's say the same kind of magnetic response uh, uh, with the same parameters in the model. Okay, so uh, when we have quasi-particle mass renormalization and at the same time magnetic response uh, as a function of temperature and doping, uh, we cannot capture those two things with the same parameters. And uh, this might not be completely surprising because of course in the magnetic response, you have here, if you look at the beta zeta equation, integrations over, over energies. And if you are uh, considering a single particle uh, 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 feature like a mass renormalization, um, uh, which is happening at the Fermi level, and you get that right with your model, it doesn't mean that uh, you get the magnetic response, right? Because for the magnetic response to be correct, you also have to capture quantities which are further away from the, uh, uh, from the Fermi energy. So the chi is not generated only at the Fermi energy, yeah? And uh, there is a second uh, uh, thing which uh, I have not gone into detail due to time reasons, namely that actually, if you look at the renormalization of the interacting, uh, uh, interaction parameter that you use in a three band model, uh, you wouldn't arrive at the static U, you wouldn't arrive at the local U. Uh, this is an additional approximation that you, that you are doing when you are using a static and local U in a single band uh, uh, model description. All right, so let me go to the next steps. Next steps uh, that we are taking in particular with Mario are now performing uh, beta zeta theta, uh, including orbital degrees of freedom um, uh, uh, in order to compute the, uh, uh, the magnet response. 
And what this allows us is not only uh, to eventually address also dynamics, so uh, 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 spectra of magnetic excitations, but it allows us also to capture uh, incommensurate features. And that's what we uh, that what that's what actually Mario found here, uh, namely when you plot this is the real part of the susceptibility again plotted here in this brilliant zone on the path uh, uh, on selected paths, uh, then you can see that there are maxima uh, which are not sitting on any high symmetry points, and they're uh, actually uh, uh, implying even incommensurate order because. It's not only that there are strong fluctuations there, but they have a finite uh, uh, near temperature also that Mario is able to estimate. And we will continue uh, down this line further. This has been uh, done, by the way, for the three band model. But there is a, a very, uh, when I saw this picture, I remember the paper uh, which I had uh, uh, on my desk as an internal referee some years ago uh, from uh, Dimitri Villardi, Cio Taranto, and Walter Metzner. Uh, about is exactly this kind of effect of uh, uh, of incommensurability um, that you get when you perform beta zeta equations uh, for the for the uh, for the Hubbard model. Okay, um, I think uh, I'm. I think I, I was uh, hurrying up almost too much, but that's I think I'm, I'm good for the for the chairman and for everyone. Uh, so this is my uh, summary. I was talking about. Uh, uh, different aspects of doing material realistic calculation. And of course, we want to do material realistic calculations because we want to have something at the end of the day which we can compare to experiment. There are these steps. There is the, the uh, modeling, the art of the modeling, then there is the method, uh, uh, which there has been, of course, uh, insane uh, amount of developments over the past uh, decades. Um, and there is then uh, what I talked about is comparison to uh, different types of models with same kind of approximation. Um, and of course, eventually also to experiment. And the, I, I just want to say that uh, there are various pitfalls here. So uh, in order to uh, explain discrepancies between experiment and your calculation, it does not necessarily mean that you are uh, missing something in the way that you uh, solve your lattice model. It might just be that you have cut off something from the bull that uh, was not meant to be cut off for the phenomena that you are trying to solve. And if you do that, uh, well, you should be aware of the bull also in these kind of oxides. And that's basically my conclusion. So thank you very much. <laughs>